directing Vermonters to stay home as much as possible and businesses to operate remotely or to close, with some exceptions. In order to provide for basic needs, we know there are some things, many things, that need to be done away from home. And we're working to provide the clearest guidance we can to help people understand what this order means to them or their businesses. So here's the bottom line. We've got to slow the spread of this virus by staying home and away from others as much as possible. This will help protect those at risk of serious illness and in too many cases, even death. It's also important to prevent our healthcare system from being overwhelmed, which keeps all Vermonters safe. Yesterday, the Center for Disease Control issued new guidance asking those in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut to refrain from non-essential travel for the next 14 days. In light of this, and my continued concern for the public health and safety of all those in Vermont, I've signed a new order today directing anyone who enters Vermont to self-quarantine for 14 days once they're here. And that means heading directly to where you're going with no stops in between. While it would be best for our friends and family from other states to follow the CDC guidance and stay where they are, I also understand some who have a home or family in Vermont may need return, to return. And it's not just our border states. This means those who have wintered across the country. We need everyone entering Vermont to be a good neighbor and abide by the self-isolation directive. And then to follow afterwards my stay home, stay safe order. To be clear, this 14-day quarantine does not apply for those just going to the grocery store or an essential job across the border. To further support my stay home order and this travel guidance, we've also included clarifying language for the lodging industry. My order last week suspended lodging operations except for specific needs to support our COVID-19 response. To provide more certainty on what this means, today's order makes clear it applies to hotels, motels, bed and breakfasts, short-term rentals, meaning those booked through Airbnb and others, and all campgrounds and RV parks. We're seeing some online booking and advertising is still occurring. This is a violation of the stay home order. And to make that crystal clear, today's new restrictions suspend online reservations. I've also asked law enforcement and the Attorney General to help with these measures, with a goal of full compliance through monitoring and education, but with the possibility of additional steps if necessary. Mr. Sherling and Attorney General Donovan will provide more details shortly and I want to thank them for their partnership. Here's what I want everyone to understand. If you don't need to come to Vermont, please don't. This is about public health and safety, which is our top priority. But having said that, we can't let this become an us versus them view of the world. That's not who we are as Americans and certainly not as Vermonters and we shouldn't let anything change that. Our message is this. If you're entering the state, you're directed to isolate in order to protect those already here, as well as the capacity of our health care system. This will help protect those currently in the state while allowing people who own a home or have a family to be here as well. We've got to remember as Americans, we're all in this together, and we all have a role to play in keeping each other safe. So I'm asking everyone to join us in this effort, to be united, and to stay Vermont strong. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Sherling for a brief update on the work of the Vermont State Police to assess lodging compliance over the weekend. Mr. Sherling. 
Good morning. Uh, over the weekend, uh, we directed uh, law enforcement in Vermont to monitor compliance, uh, in particular with lodging properties here uh, in Vermont. Uh, 318 properties are, uh, are known uh, to exist in Vermont, exclusive of the, uh, the Airbnb type properties. Of that, this is a running spreadsheet of those checks. Uh, Vermont State Police and local law enforcement were able to successfully check on all of those properties. Uh, of them, 88 were open. Half of those 88 were in compliance. In other words, they were uh, housing folks that were um, involved in the response, visiting nurses, um, healthcare professionals, military folks, uh, flight crews that are flying in and out of Burlington International Airport and the like. Uh, 44 appear to be non-compliant. For those non-compliant properties, yesterday they received a letter uh, from the Department of Health and the Department of Public Safety indicating that they need to bring their operations into compliance, uh, and the Attorney General's Office will be following up with that cross-section of apparent non-compliant properties today. Uh, after that, there will be regular, regular monitoring by law enforcement. Folks can expect to see uh, troopers and law enforcement uh, in the parking lots and checking in with staff there to ensure compliance. Again, this relates exclusively uh, to the health uh, of Vermonters and uh, the capacity of our health care system. Um, to emphasize, we really expect voluntary compliance with this stepped-up effort uh, to do these cross-checks, the letter, and subsequent phone calls by the Attorney General's office. Uh, we have every belief that these properties will uh, become compliant and uh, that we'll be able to, uh, to maintain health and safety as a result. Thank you. Good morning. I've always believed that the best way to enforce the laws to give people the opportunity to comply with it. And I want to thank the governor uh, for his leadership during this crisis and his philosophy uh, of that enforcement principle, that we work with Vermonters who need our help, and we ask Vermonters to comply with the governor's executive order because we all have a role to play in this crisis. As Commissioner Sherling said, the Attorney General's office is reaching out to those 40 or so hotels and lodging establishments this morning. We're asking them to comply with the governor's order. We will work with you if you have questions. I do want to say that the governor's executive order does carry penalties. There are civil penalties that range from $1,000 to up to $10,000 per violation. There is also a criminal penalty that carries a $500 fine and a maximum penalty of six months imprisonment. I want to be very clear. The last thing any of us want to do is enforce these orders and seek those penalties. We are asking for your compliance. We're asking for your cooperation. That being said, we also know that we all have a role to play during this crisis. We're prepared to do our job. The Attorney General's office is prepared to do its job. We'll be reaching out to you today. If you have questions, talk with us. We will work with you, uh, and we are prepared to partner with uh, the Vermont State Police, the Department of Public Safety, and Governor Scott to do what's best for our state of Vermont. Thank you. With that, I turn it over to Commissioner Levine. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, this morning I'd like to briefly uh, put the executive orders in a public health context, uh, repeat some of what I've said previously about testing, provide a bit of a situational report, and uh, wrap up with uh, the website. If we're to succeed in flattening the curve and preserving the capacity of our health care system, it is essential for the health and safety of all Vermonters that everyone strictly comply with Governor Scott's executive orders. We can do it if everyone pulls together in the same direction. Social distancing, as I've said before, is not our natural state, and it's difficult and challenging for everyone. I've done a lot of observation over the past weekend and was overall pretty pleased with what I saw with some conscious distancing uh, for uh, people that I encountered. I've also been getting lots of emails and cards and letters, though, about Vermonters who are concerned about a hopefully minority of the state that doesn't take this as seriously and doesn't understand uh, the importance of this as a true intervention strategy to really 
improve our performance against this virus. I just want you to listen to the comments I make later on um, regarding uh, what's going on in Vermont now to put my concern into context and to really have everyone take this as seriously as possible. Now, regarding the most recent executive order, because there are now so many hotspots around the country, asking Vermonters who are returning from other states to self-isolate upon their return home and preventing travelers from other states from residing in lodging sites for prolonged periods is no different than policies that you may recall are just a few weeks old around the country that did the same for travelers coming back from China and Italy and other such places. This is just plain sound public health practice and it will protect us all. Regarding testing, this weekend in collaboration with the National Guard Civil Support Team, an additional COVID-19 patient test site at Landmark College in Putney was successfully stood up. This site will provide additional capacity for testing for people who have a referral from their health care provider. As I've said before, early and broad testing is a proven strategy to limit the spread of this virus. Vermont is still early enough on the curve of positive cases that we hope that increased testing can have a large impact on our ability to flatten the curve. I want to stress again, though, that you can't just show up and be tested mainly because if you do not have symptoms, the virus might not be detected and you might actually be falsely reassured that you don't harbor the virus. And secondly, because we continue to rely on your own physician's judgment about your illness, and then we try to identify, counsel, and isolate those who test positive, conduct contact tracing, and quarantine as clinically appropriate. We're all counting on each other to do everything we can to meet this public health crisis head on. Now, as our testing capacity increases, you can expect to see an increase in the number of positive tests. This will reflect more tests and not necessarily more transmission of disease. We'll need to look closely at the proportion of tests that are positive and trends in our data not just the absolute number of tests. In terms of what our uh, status was as of last night with uh, COVID-19 in the state, there were 21 new cases yesterday, 256 total cases at this point in time. Still 12 deaths, seven of them from the outbreak at Burlington Health and Rehab, five from patients that were hospitalized uh, at various locations in the state. We continue to follow the outbreak at Burlington Health and Rehab quite closely. We are now also following another outbreak <clears throat> that you may have uh, seen on the news uh, just today at a facility in Essex Junction. This is a senior living facility. This facility is not a long-term care facility, not a nursing home. Um, it is not a health care facility. It is essentially uh, a building with over 50 apartments in it where people are independently living with the only criteria for being housed there is your age is 55 or greater. So needless to say, there are some people that are in the greater category and some are more frail and may have chronic illnesses, as you would expect. There are now two deaths associated with that facility. One, not a person that was living there, uh, but that was um, a significant other of an employee there. And the second uh, occurring over the weekend, uh, someone who was actually living there. The health department has been very involved over the last five to six days with its basic work that it does in all of these outbreak situations, which is making sure they're aware of all people who were in contact with that initial case that brought the disease in 
and making sure that we've done all the appropriate follow-up on them, made sure that they all <clears throat> are connected with uh, their health care providers if they become symptomatic, and make sure they are all isolating as is appropriate. This is ongoing, and obviously it's more breaking news, so I won't have a lot more details to provide you with there. Uh, but we've been uh, in constant contact and helped the facility with its own communications to the residents there. In closing, I want everyone to please stay safe, stay home, and keep informed. Based on the number of um, hits, I guess is the word, to the healthcare website, many of you are using that for information, healthvermont.gov. It continues to have the latest information and answers to your questions. Last week, we added an automated web bot to the page. With this tool, you can type in a question and the bot will search a knowledge base that is updated daily from our extensive FAQs, frequently asked questions. We can use the questions people input to keep expanding our FAQs in a collapsible, collapsible section called Ask a Question About COVID-19. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, we have um, Secretary Smith, um, Agency of Human Services on the phone, who will be answering questions, any questions that might arise in his, uh, his area of expertise. And we have a lot of questions, a lot of reporters, media on the phone as well. So we're going to do our best to get through those questions. Uh, and if you can be prepared with a star six to unmute yourself, that would be very helpful. All right, we're going to start with Lisa Loomis at the Valley Reporter, star six to unmute. Lisa Loomis. All right, we're going to move to Joe Gresser at the Barton Chronicle. Star six to unmute, Joe. Yep. Hello, um, Governor. Hi, Joe. I'm, uh, I'm curious, um, how much additional testing will be necessary to get a very clear sense of what the progress uh, resulting from staying in place might be? I mean, how long can we uh, will we have to wait to see uh, a change in the curve? Uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Levine answer that. Thanks. If we use Wuhan, China as our guide, um, and that was the most rigid of social distancing and mitigation strategies, as you know, um, there was about a 14-day period that elapsed for that. So most people think it's in the several week range. I might add though that as we, so, and it's not really in the testing itself. The testing helps provide greater precision to all of our modeling and our projections. Uh, the fact that we are now in the 200s range of cases is helping refine that modeling significantly. Um, but obviously we'll be watching very, very closely over time. And Testing isn't the only outcome, obviously, to see if we've reached a plateau in cases. We'll obviously be looking at um, other medical factors in the population in terms of you know, illness and hospitalizations and things of that sort. All right, Sean Cooper at the Boston Globe. Uh, thank you. Um, I've just got a quick question about the difference in total between the map and the graph that's published uh, on the health department website today. Um, is, there's a difference between um, the map and the, and the graph, and I wondered if those totals represent the number of residents of other states uh, who've tested positive. Dr. Levine. I'm going to have to check that out because I don't have it in front of me, but 
Um, it is true that we've had a number of positive tests of people who live in other states, predominantly New Hampshire, but other states as well, uh, that might explain that. And we've had some Vermonters whose positive test occurred in another state. Um, so I'll get back with a more precise answer, but I suspect it's one of those two. Thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Star six to unmute Greg, County Courier. Go ahead, Greg. Greg, you may need to unmute your phone or we're going to move to the next caller. All right, moving to Andrew at the Caledonia. Can you hear me? Oh, go ahead, Greg. Okay, thank you, Governor. Uh, it's my understanding that the state is uh, acquiring refrigerated trucks. Uh, other states have done this for bodies related to the COVID-19 uh, virus. Is that what this is for, and uh, where would those trucks be located? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Greg. Um, we are uh, currently searching uh, for trucks to be, just be prepared. We hope it doesn't come to that, uh, but uh, considering uh, the, the number of people uh, who are the morticians in the uh, in the Vermont, uh, we have to be prepared, prepared for most anything. And uh, we'll be strategically placing those around the state if it becomes necessary, but we want to make sure, again, that we're prepared for the worst. Thank you, Governor. Andrew, Caledonia Courier. Go ahead, Andrew, star six to unmute. Um, my question is uh, to, to the modeling. Um, uh, at a press conference last week, you spoke about more precise modeling as the numbers increase. How has the modeling changed over the last several days, and how has uh, uh, the state's efforts to increase hospital capacity, PPE, ventilators, things like that, matching up with these new models? Yeah, we're refining our modeling as we speak. Um, we're hoping uh, to make it more public as the week uh, progresses because I think it, it does highlight uh, some of the challenges we face and why we're doing taking some of the steps that we're taking today. Um, so uh, at this point in time, um, we uh, I might ask uh, uh, Commissioner Sherling uh, to talk a little bit about our uh, preparedness in terms of PPE and, and ventilators and so forth. Um, but do it, we're trying to stay on top of that. Uh, but we're watching the modeling as well. And, and that's why, uh, again, if we take the steps we're, we're advocating for today and last week, uh, we hope to stay underneath the line, the line of, uh, of the capacity of the health care system. And that's, that's our goal. Mr. Sherling. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I think the Governor covered the modeling component uh, relative to PPE and, and ventilator and uh, surge capacity. There are teams continuing to work on those things. We have literally millions of, uh, of items on order in the PPE supply chains. We're working closely with the hospitals uh, and the federal government to try to ensure that we get as many of those units as possible. Uh, the update on ventilators is we have over 400 that have been ordered and we're working daily to get delivery dates for those. There are Parallel efforts also, uh, including efforts to explore whether Vermont manufacturers can produce certain types of PPE, uh, and uh, there's a parallel effort actually to develop uh, a, a ventilator that could be constructed here as quickly as possible, um, and uh, additional efforts to, uh, to ensure that, if possible, we can use uh, a ventilator for more than one uh, patient. And uh, important to note that we're working in support of the health care professionals, the Department of Health and the hospitals uh, on those efforts in particular. I might add, and uh, Commissioner Sherling, uh, unless I misstate this, uh, we, did, uh, we did receive um, some, uh, some uh, support from the federal government over the last couple of days. A number of trucks have been brought in with some of the PPE uh, equipment that we need. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's good news, but it doesn't mean that we relax. In in some respects, we we're pulling every lever we can uh, using 
some of uh, in-house uh, uh, and, and searching uh, throughout the country to be sure that we have uh, all of the available uh, uh, equipment that we need uh, to fight this. It's a uh, great point, Governor. Uh, six trucks arrived uh, to the state's warehouse uh, over the weekend. We anticipate additional trucks will be inbound. Uh, the state's storage warehouse for PPE actually can't handle the amount that it's storing at the moment, which is partially a good sign. So there's an additional warehouse space that the Guard is assisting to set up. And Guard teams are now taking over some of the logistics in support of the Department of Health and the Department of Public Safety because of the volume that we anticipate needing to move. All set, Andrew? Okay. All right, we're going to move to Chris Roy at the Newport Daily Express. Star six to unmute. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, how, um, how is the state going to enforce self-isolation for the folks who are returning to Vermont, maybe from their winter homes or traveling? Um, how are you going to ensure that those folks, that those folks self-isolate? Uh, admittedly, Chris, uh, that's uh, very difficult. Uh, as you can well imagine, uh, someone coming in, driving back home uh, after wintering in, let's say, Florida, uh, coming back home, uh, and then w we can only educate and advocate uh, for them to do the right thing, to protect uh, their neighbors, to protect their friends, to protect their family uh, members. This is the right thing to do. Uh, it's literally in your hands uh, to do your part. And we're asking, that's why we're, we're having all the message boards along the, the interstates, uh, in the, in the uh, airports and so forth, uh, to, to make sure the message gets across. If you're coming into the state, make sure you, you self-isolate for 14 days. Uh, and again, uh, we, uh, we, we are not going to be able to enforce our way through this, uh, but uh, we can ask Vermonters to do the right thing. Anything else, Chris? Okay. Ann Galloway, BT Digger, star six to unmute. Ann Galloway, star six to unmute. Okay, go ahead, Ann. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Governor, when will hospitalization rates per day be released? The, the number of people in the hospitals at this point in time with the, with the COVID-19? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's a good question. Um, I, did, uh, did, I did talk about that over the, over the weekend. I'm going to turn this over uh, to Secretary Smith, who probably has the answer. Sure, Ann, thank you very much. Um, I did get that, that answer for you, as I had said over the weekend. Right now, in all our hospitals, we have uh, 19 COVID-19 inpatients. That's 19. There's one in central Vermont. There's one in Mount Chesney. There is two in Northwestern. There is uh, zero in Rutland Regional right now, there's Southwestern Vermont Regional at two, UVM at 13, and Porter Medical at zero. And here's how we're gonna start doing this. Each night at eight o'clock, the hospital will report the COVID-19 inpatient numbers. I will have those numbers each day uh, for us to report uh, going forward here. So we'll have those numbers each day now. Anything else, Ann? Yeah, thank you. All right. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Good morning, Governor. Um, the state of Vermont is the largest employer in the state, and of course the budget is getting hit pretty hard here. Have uh, redundant employees, you know, DMV workers on the front end, have there any been layoffs or furloughs or what do you plan? Maybe they've been um, redeployed in some way. What is, what is your plan for um, state workforce? Yeah, we're redeploying as many as we can. Uh, for instance, uh, using some of the DMV employees to help with the uh, 
the Labor Department uh, surge that we've seen uh, in other areas of government as well. Obviously, uh, this is going to work trying to focus on the crisis itself uh, today, uh, but our budget is going to be uh, problematic, uh, obviously. Uh, so we are going to work alongside the, the legislature, uh, alongside our congressional delegation, to provide for whatever relief we can, knowing we have to provide essential services to Vermont. Uh, but, uh, but we have to be realistic as well. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll work through, uh, get again, get through the next uh, three to four weeks. Uh, but ongoing, we're, we're trying to dissect the, the federal bill to see what this means to Vermont and Vermonters and as well as our state budget. Uh, and then uh, and, and monitor uh, what else is needed. Uh, I, the congressional delegation has been uh, been uh, ongoing, having ongoing support for us. I speak to uh, uh, Congressman Welch and, and probably Senator Leahy uh, almost daily, and they uh, they want to be a willing partner. So as we move forward, again, uh, we'll see where the challenges are, and see what we can do to uh, to mitigate that. Okay, perfect. So probably a question for Commissioner Levine. So regarding that um, facility in Essex, um, how many people have uh, tested positive for COVID-19? How many people are being monitored? And is there a plan in place for uh, widespread testing within the facility? So number one, I'm aware of one that has tested positive. We're currently aware of and have been in communication with uh, 10 who we believe had the intense exposure. And we're going to continue to abide by what I mentioned in my opening comments, that uh, testing is not treatment, and testing will occur for those who become symptomatic in consultation with their health care providers. Everyone who has been identified as a significant contact is, by definition, doing what they would do if they were a positive test, which is self-isolating, assuming they were not so ill they had to be in a hospital. And that is the basic rule uh, of how public health works in this kind of a situation. Uh, so um, testing, you know, in, in a broader sense, is really not uh, indicated. Um, other places where you have healthcare workers in contact with people, uh, not just an independent living situation, that becomes a bit of a different equation. But in this situation, um, that's really what's happened. So there's no plan for wide-scale testing of every individual living in the building. And then I guess just to follow up, so because it's an independent living as opposed to like an assisted living, so I guess, uh, is there any different guidance or support that's being um, offered to the residents there? Or? Um, probably it's the same guidance no matter which setting, to be honest. Because uh, even if you're not a close contact, and you live in another apartment, you're supposed to be abiding by all of the rules that came down in the executive order in terms of social distancing, in terms of staying at home, staying safe. So that would be the advice that everyone would have anyways. The major issue in buildings like this, as opposed to living in your own home, are that there are now congregate settings in those buildings. So there's a room where everybody goes for laundry. There's a room where everybody goes to get their mail. Uh, there are card playing rooms and things of that sort for social activities. Uh, so we have to be very direct about advising people to not be congregating in those particular parts of the building. Um, does that answer your question? I, th I think what was uh, also interesting in terms of what uh, Dr. Levine had described to me earlier uh, was that if you're not um, um, symptomatic, uh, and you're asymptomatic, uh, the tests aren't as accurate. And so you might get a false sense of security if you have the test early and think you don't have it when you might. So you have to just assume uh, it to, that you, you may have it uh, and to self-isolate and, and monitor your own symptoms. Uh, take your temperature. Make sure you're taking care of yourself by staying away from others. I mean, it's very clear. It's not any different than it's just a home. Uh, and so so stay away from others uh, and make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Just 
just like if you're traveling from a hot spot into a remote. Right. Oh, yeah, right. I mean, it's the same principle as if you're traveling from a hot spot outside the borders of Vermont into Vermont again. We want you to make the assumption you may be harboring the virus and not symptomatic yet. All right, Mike Donahue, Vermont Press Association. Star six to unmute, Mike. Yep. We've got you. Hello, okay. Thanks, Governor. Uh, I have a two-part uh, question dealing with uh, access to COVID-19 cases and full transparency. As we've seen, uh, in Grand Isle and Essex counties, uh, they continue to have no reported cases. Of course, they have no hospitals either. What I'm wondering in Grand Isle County, we continue to hear reports of a few individuals with positive cases, including at least one whose name was out on social media being in a St. Albans hospital. So is it that the Grand Isle cases, if there are any, are actually being counted in other counties like Chittenden and Franklin County? presumably the same in Essex County, that they're going to hospitals either in St. John's Ferry or New Hampshire. Yeah, I, the second part about access to information is I've been told by employees at two different hospitals that they are not told where the COVID-19 patients are on certain floors, and this causes concerns by employees not to have full disclosure that they're working on floors. Is there anything the state or the health department can do to encourage transparency to the staff that are working at these hospitals. I'm going to ask uh, Secretary Smith if he has the answers to either one of those questions or both, and then to, uh, Dr. Levine to follow up. Yeah, I don't, Mike, but let me, uh, Mike Donahue, this is Mike Smith, I don't, but let me uh, check on those to get, see if I can get some answers for you on the, the first part of your question, the second part of your question, the medical question, and I'll leave it to Dr. Levine. Thank you. On the first question, I would definitely hope that if there was a case in Grand Isle, it would be listed as Grand Isle County because it would have to do with the place of residence, not the place where the test was done. Um, because we definitely want that data, as does everyone else. So uh, I would hope that is not the case. With regard to the second, um, you're, you're actually speaking to basic infection control practices at various hospitals. And I'm quite comfortable that our hospitals understand infection control practices have specific personnel in place that, are, that have expertise in that area and that they would be abiding by that. Um, so I would hate to think that there would be an employee that feels they're at risk because that fact and that knowledge is not known. Um, if you could provide us... Just to, uh, be clear, just, just to be clear, there are other people in other departments that may not be dealing with the COVID-19 cases that are on the same floor, but haven't been told that the COVID-19, so. Yeah, so, uh, I, you know, I, I guess I'd need to hear more specific cases because clearly anybody who is either known COVID-19 or a person under investigation awaiting a test result is under a very strict isolation procedure so that those going in and out of the room specifically would be aware of what they need to be donning in terms of the appropriate protective equipment uh, every time that happened. And they wouldn't just casually be going in the room to say, clean the floor or get a, a tray off the patient's tray table. Uh, I, there would be knowledge of that. So again, I would need specifics, but I, I, I can't believe that the basic infection control practices and practices that are frankly protective for the employees uh, wouldn't be uh, happening there. Okay, thank you. And Mike Smith, you'll, or the commissioner will check on the, I think there's 126 cases, presumably between like Franklin and Chittenden, to see if any of those have residents yep. in Grand Isle County. Yeah, Mike, one of us will, will check, but it, the, Dr. Levine is right. What we see every day is the 
county of residence for those people, but let us check to make sure, Mike. Thank you. Stuart. Governor, um, your state state order expires in two weeks. Uh, as you know, last night, uh, the president extended the national directive to uh, all of April. Is there any doubt in your mind that you will have to extend the state state safe order through at least April? Uh, and secondly, what is your projection for when Vermont might peak? Yeah, um, two parts to that question. First of all, uh, I think everyone should expect uh, that this will be extended uh, April 15th and beyond, uh, just trying to determine how long that's going to be and what provisions will be in place as we do that uh, and as we amend, as we move forward. Um, in terms of how long, uh, that's a good question. Um, and I think it's up to all of us uh, to make sure that we implement all the measures that we put into place in the executive order and all the amendments since. Uh, the sooner we do that, uh, the sooner we'll get through this uh, and we'll, uh, we'll continue to monitor and we'll, again, be sharing uh, some of the modeling with you, with, uh, with, uh, with Vermonters, uh, over, the next, uh, over the next few days, uh, because I think it really is important uh, for you to understand the magnitude, if we don't get this right, what it could mean and how quickly it could overwhelm our health care system. And that's what we want to prevent. You know, we, have, we need to make sure that we're increasing the capacity, lift that line uh, of uh, the capacity of our health care system, making sure that we have uh, uh, a surge capacity there, making sure we have all the equipment we need uh, to, to fight this. Uh, but at the same time, it's literally in our hands. If we, if we take this seriously, we stay away from each other, we self-isolate, and, uh, and th this will go a lot better uh, than the alternative. So it's really important that you pay attention. All right, Tanya, the Islander. Star six to unmute, Tanya. All right, Pat Bradley, WAMC. Pat Bradley, WAMC. All right, Cliff Cooper. Hey, hi, can oh. you hear me okay? Go ahead, Pat. Hi, how are you? Um, Governor, Good, uh, good morning. Um, you had mentioned earlier that um, the mandate that your order requires residents and non-residents coming from outside the state to self-quarantine for 14 days is targeted for people coming in from hot spots um, and that it doesn't necessarily impact people who are coming over who are working between Northern New York and Northern Vermont. Uh, can you clarify the types of businesses that that impacts? And secondarily, have you consulted with the neighboring governors like Governor Cuomo about this addendum and its potential uh, impacts? Um, two, two things, I can give an example. Let's say uh, someone who is living over in, in Plattsburgh uh, is working at UVM Medical Center. Uh, they're part of the COVID-19 response. So we understand they'll be going back and forth. Uh, so that would be allowed. Uh, if, for instance, uh, someone uh, is in the uh, uh, dealing with national security, uh, working for Border Patrol or something of that nature, uh, that would be exempted as well. Um, I uh, have uh, spoken to a number of governors. I uh, have not spoken to Governor uh, Cuomo, uh, but our other neighbors, uh, um, Governor Sununu, uh, Governor Baker in particular, uh, I speak to on a regular basis. Um, so we're all trying to deal with this, uh, understanding that we're, we're individual states and have individual needs, um, but, uh, but there clearly uh, should be uh, some more coordination uh, throughout the nation uh, in some respects because we do this patchwork uh, and, and, and I believe in states' rights and I believe that we should be doing everything we can, uh, again, individually to protect our, our citizens, protect our, our, our Vermonters in this case. Uh, but, uh, but when we have a difference in uh, what we're, we're implementing, 
it does have an effect on other states. Uh, for instance, if someone was in Vermont, uh, a company in Vermont that was closed down, we closed them down uh, to, uh, to prevent the spread here in Vermont, but they can work over in New York, uh, and then they start commuting back and forth, uh, that's problematic. Uh, and so my, uh, my guidance is for any uh, one or any company uh, going to another state to work for something that's not essential, uh, that they stay there. And uh, if they're going to work there, stay there. And, uh, and if you come back, uh, isolate for 14 days once you return. And is this order going to pretty much mirror your stay-at-home order the length of time if you you know, extend the stay-at-home order, this will also be extended along with it? It's tough to say at this point, uh, Pat. Uh, you know, we're some of the considerations, that's why I haven't extended it at this point, although you can expect that the order will be extended. Uh, but uh, we'll determine at that point uh, what, what we need to include, what we don't. Um, if there's any, you know, we can only hope uh, that we, we peak uh, before then, but our modeling doesn't show that, uh, to be honest. And um, so I, I expect it'll be extended, uh, but for how long, I'm not sure at this point. Thank you, sir. All right, Cliff Cooper, North Avenue News. Cliff, star six to unmute. Yeah, this is Cliff Cooper from the North Avenue Newspaper. I've just got a question about the U.S. mail and um, the carriers don't have gloves, masks, neither do the tellers. Um, what, what I can, you know, I'm going to let Dr. Levine answer part of this, uh, but okay. I see a number of people uh, wearing uh, gloves, for instance. Um, that doesn't necessarily um, provide relief, and, and uh, it doesn't insulate you from either transmitting this to others or transmitting it to yourself, uh, because the glove itself uh, could be contaminated with the virus and then you could touch your face with the glove uh, so that's the point is not to touch your face uh, to remind or remain uh, at, a, at a safe distance from others um, you know masks and shields I've seen where uh, convenience stores and other entities in Vermont that remain open have put shields in uh, themselves makeshift shift Lexan type shields uh, that uh, will do the job uh, and I think that that's what they should do. And I believe the post offices uh, should do that as well. And, and for those who are delivering mail, um, they, should, uh, they should take that precaution on their own uh, to make sure they're protecting uh, themselves and others uh, during this crisis. Okay. All right, Wilson Ring, AP. Wilson Ring, AP. All right, Courtney Landon, seven days. Oh, wait, somebody's on there Wilson, now. Is that you, Wilson? Yes, it is. Sorry, I had to do the star six three times to get through. Um, I had two questions here. Um, one about the, the, the hotels that you found and other lodging facilities that were not in compliance, the 40 something. How responsive were they? Presumably you pointed out that they were not in compliance. And how responsive were they to that? And just to, to that being pointed out to them. And then secondly, um, is there any estimate yet on when Vermont expects to see a peak? Uh, I'll let uh, Commissioner Sherling answer the first part. Uh, in terms of responsivity, the initial contact on Saturday was just reconnaissance to see uh, what levels of compliance. Yesterday, they were delivered letters, as I indicated, uh, and then there'll be follow-up calls uh, that begin today. So I don't think we have a full gauge of, of uh, the responsivity at this point, um, but we expect uh, that folks will largely be compliant with the 44 properties that, again, uh, to be clear, uh, appeared to be out of compliance. This was not an in-depth uh, detailed investigation. Okay, thank you. 
Um, in terms of the second uh, part of your question, Wilson, um, I don't want to get ahead of the, what we're doing with the modeling, trying to refine that. Uh, but, uh, but suffice it to say, it's sometime, we feel, sometime in April. Um, but we'll be sharing that uh, as uh, the days go on here this week. Thank you. Uh, all right, just we have, still have several callers uh, that we're trying to get through. So just a reminder for everybody, or for clarity, we will be having a separate briefing on the modeling uh, and projections this week. So there will be more uh, de details and a, de and a briefing scheduled specifically for that later this week. We're going to go in, in the room to Fox 44. Um, question for Dr. Levine. <clears throat> um, just wondering if you have any information or know anything about a staff member at Pinecrest Senior Living in Essex Junction who has COVID-19 and went to work still? You're making it sound like currently as opposed to previously. Yeah, well, if they have it and like had gone to work, they yeah. still have it. Yeah, so we believe previously there was a staff member <clears throat> who was unaware of their status who may have been infectious for a couple of days. Uh, we're not aware of anyone currently. And uh, for you, Mike, probably, but uh, I received several calls over the weekend uh, from people in the Valley um, who are in that uh, danger zone as far as uh, medical and, uh, and age. Um, and they were concerned about the B&B still operating and they've seen them constantly running back and forth and they, they were worried that uh, they either A, weren't part of it and Governor Yu uh, already gave us the answer to that, but is there any, anything in the works to, to hit the Airbnbs at all? Yeah, again, uh, we're doing the same thing. Uh, this approach uh, pertains to them. We saw the same thing. We heard from the same people. Uh, and we're trying to uh, make sure that they comply. Uh, Mr. Sherling, anything to add on that? Sure. Uh, with the additional clarity that was issued uh, today, we fully expect Airbnb uh, operators, if you know them, if you're listening, you need to shut down your operations. We will begin monitoring for online postings uh, this week, and we'll be making referrals for contact to the Attorney General's office thereafter. And to, just to add to that, uh, we we are part of the order is to to close the online reservation uh, portion. So uh, I know that uh, I think uh, Commissioner Sherling, you told me earlier that uh, on the on the page, the Airbnb uh, page, uh, that there is a already a notice uh, that's going up uh, at this point in time. There is. Uh, we expect that there'll be additional clarity after today. Some, you know, you know, let's let's be honest. Some didn't uh, know or. Uh, didn't know that they, it pertained to them. Uh, and that's why part of the education, a part of what we did uh, to try and get the word out, and that's why it's important that we do, and we hope uh, all of you will carry that as well. All right, Courtney Landon, seven days. Hi, Governor. Um, this, actually, this question might actually be for Commiss Commissioner Sherling. I'm wondering if someone could detail what kind of supplies Vermont has requested from the federal government and how much of that uh, equipment we have received versus how much we're still waiting on. Thank you. Um, just to be clear, uh, we're not waiting on anything from the federal government uh, in some respects. We're going and we're pulling every lever we possibly can and finding uh, a lot on our own. Uh, we should be able to share some of that uh, information with you again this week, uh, we, we hope. Uh, but uh, I'll let Commissioner Sherling answer the rest of that. We have standing requests for millions of uh, personal protective items from the federal government. Uh, over, I think our request is for 600 ventilators. Um, and we've received a cross section of N95 masks, surgical masks, gowns, and face shields. Uh, hundreds of thousands of those items have come into the warehouse. I don't have the exact counts in front of me. Uh, the, again, as the governor indicated, that is one avenue of exploration to bolster these supplies. It is not by any means the exclusive avenue. Thank 
Ethan, Burlington Free Press, Star Six. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, is there any indication so far, at least, that the new expanded testing policy is working? And uh, in addition, is our congressional delegation helping Vermont secure more test kits? Um, I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Levine answer the the testing portion, but I just would add uh, that it's not instantaneous. Uh, it takes a, a bit of time uh, in terms of uh, extraction, uh, then turning it over to the lab, uh, and depending on whether it's done in in house in the state lab versus us sending it to an outside lab, uh, let's say Mayo Clinic, uh, it takes a little bit more time for us to get it to them and, and to return, but. Uh, but I would also add, uh, in the terms of uh, in terms of mail, uh, we are not waiting. Uh, we're not shipping it uh, by uh, by UPS or FedEx or, or U.S. Mail. Uh, we're flying it there, uh, and uh, we're doing this uh, twice a day, uh, starting uh, today, I believe. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Uh, so uh, we're uh, we're being aggressive with this. Uh, we want to get the results back just as quick as we possibly can. And our testing in-house, uh, we can we can have results within 24 hours. But again, we're not going to see this for a day or two. Uh, but uh, the Putney uh, testing, uh, I've uh, I've heard back uh, that it was a, a successful start yesterday, and continues to be today. Dr. Levine, not a, not a lot to add to that. But um, any strategy that you begin in terms of combating COVID-19. You have to maintain at least a 10, 14, or longer day period of time to see the impact. Uh, so certainly would not be instantaneous, especially if you understand that the incubation period of the virus can be as few as two days or as long as 14 days. Thank you. Michelle Monroe, St. Albans Messenger, star six to unmute. Michelle Monroe. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? Oh, great. I was just wondering what steps are being taken uh, to protect the um, prison population and the staff who work in the prison. I'm going to uh, refer to Secretary Smith on that, if you're still on the line. I sure am, Governor. Um, Michelle, like I said the other day, there's been extensive uh, sort of precautions um, that I've never seen before in the prison population in terms of what we're doing. First of all, we have suspended all in-person visitation rights um, for the prison population. We have done that now and substituted video conferencing for the inmates for, uh, for visitation rights. Secondly, uh, we have uh, we, we have uh, established um, sort of spacing. And as you know, right now, our prison population is at some of the lowest that it's been in quite a while. We're just under 1,500. I think a year ago, we were at 1,600. So that allows us to get some spacing. We are monitoring employees coming in in terms of temperature checks as we move forward. and. We have on-site supplies for testing for inmates. And right now, we have no positive tests that have occurred in the inmate population. We've also ramped up our supplies to make sure that we don't run out of supplies in the, uh, in the prison population. So we've, we've been very, very aggressive in, the, in our correction facilities and will continue to be aggressive as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had a question that you can hear me. We can. Okay, great. Uh, this is uh, about infrastructure. After Irene, um, I'm sure you'll recall that we rebuilt um, culverts and bridges and everything to withstand the future events. Um, right now, uh, our infrastructure for the internet is, is inadequate for many people working at home or trying to learn at home. I wonder if there's any effort underway to uh, maybe use the bully pulpit to talk to consolidated to, uh, and other internet providers to beef up service. In some cases, I understand it's just a matter of 
installing a new switch um, in neighborhoods. So uh, this is a, a need I've heard from people pretty much all over the state, um, and I'm wondering if there's any effort in that regard. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, as you can, as you may recall, uh, after Irene, uh, there were a, less, a lot of lessons learned, uh, and we uh, and we did things better after that. We built bridges differently. Uh, we uh, we dealt with uh, uh, obstructions differently. We did we did many things uh, in a in a different manner. We'll do the same thing in the aftermath of uh, of this uh, crisis as well. And I think uh, the. the um, Accessibility uh, to broadband is one area that is uh, uh, certainly something we knew about before, uh, but it's going to take resources in order to do that. But if there's anything we can do easily, obviously uh, we'll do them. Uh, but this is uh, another area I've talked with the congressional delegation already about, uh, you know, in the recovery. Um, we're still dealing with a crisis today, but in the recovery, uh, this might be an area that uh, we could uh, all use some help across uh, the United States in terms of making sure that we have uh, accessible broadband um, so that uh, when we go to online learning and, and other uh, areas where we're, we're isolating ourselves, uh, that we have the capacity to do this. But I, but I will say, I mean, we're, we're learning as we go. Uh, and uh, and I, I take my hat off to all Vermonters uh, for finding their way through this. I mean, I mean, even our own office, even myself, uh, where we're doing uh, a lot of video conferencing, uh, a lot of calls like we're doing today. I think the silver lining, I, again, I was remarking after a press conference uh, on Friday, the silver lining to this is so many people are calling in and we're hearing from all parts of the state where typically in a press conference we have at the state house, uh, there's just a handful of local reporters there. Uh, but now we're, we're getting from all different regions and their ability to ask questions and, and be able to communicate uh, is something that I think is really important. So uh, in the aftermath of this, we'll learn uh, from the best practices and uh, be able to do better. Any immediate efforts though to talk to the providers? I, I think I would say our public uh, service department um, Commissioner Tierney is uh, is constantly uh, asking them to expand, uh, and we're providing whatever help we can, guidance uh, to to do so. So, uh, yes, I would say it's an ongoing effort to make sure that we're we're dealing with a crisis at hand right now, and part of that is making sure that there's capacity. So, anything we can do, we're doing. If you if there's anything that you think we should be doing, uh, please uh, offer that up and let us know uh, so that we can. We can make sure that we go uh, to them if we haven't seen it or, um, highlighted already. All right, all set, John. Oops. Okay, uh, Patricia LaBeouf at Ber uh, Bennington Banner. Patricia at Bennington Banner. All right, Nora at the Valley News. Oh, I think it's Hello? Hi, Patricia. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Star Six is giving me some trouble. Um, good morning. So I, I was just noticed actually just earlier today, uh, testing seems to be a large part of mitigating the spread of the virus and preventing death. I know they mentioned specifically um, Germany and I believe South Korea have extended sense of testing and it has been reported the U.S. lies behind other countries in testing. I saw a new test was just granted emergency use author authorization by the FDA and is expected to roll out this week. It provides results in approximately 15 minutes, and it says that um, that particular test can, the company that makes that particular test can do about 50,000 per day. And I'm wondering if Vermont is aware of this possible new test, and if so, if you guys are seeking to use it in any capacity. Yeah, I've seen that uh, on the national news as well. And uh, suffice it to say, if it's available uh, to us, uh, in, uh, we would uh, we'd be utilizing it. Uh, but at this point in time, I don't believe uh, that uh, we have seen that, uh, and, and the availability uh, is not has not been known to me, um, mm -hmm. Commissioner Levine. And it all depends on which kind of test you're talking about. There's the test that's actually looking for the active virus uh, in a secretion, 
And then there's the test that's looking at your blood to see if you have an antibody response to the virus. So I'm not sure if you're aware of which one you're, you're talking about, but... Um, I know the maker, is, um, the maker is called Abbott, the maker of the test, and sure. it would be results in uh, 15 minutes, so it's a very, very, very rapid test, and I believe that says all that I, but it's like a, it's like a swab test, my understanding is that patients could yeah. actually swab themselves. Right, so, you know, things are happening at a very rapid timeline with uh, emergency use authorizations and the FDA. So obviously, if this becomes a prime time thing that's accessible to us and can help in our efforts, we'll certainly pursue that avenue. Uh, right now, we literally have uh, a bunch of irons in the fire uh, for a variety of test regimens, some of which will give us even greater, uh, improved over the 24-hour turnaround, uh, even if it's not in 15 minutes. And those are going to be standing up in the very near future. So. We're using everything that we know that's existing, and what you're describing is evolving and emerging, and so we'll have to evaluate it and see if it's accessible and if it's worth pursuing. Thanks. All right, thank you. Nora, Valley News. Nora, Valley News. Right. Alan Keyes, Digger. Oh, Nora's on right now. Nora, are you on? All right, we're going to move on to Alan Keyes at Digger. Uh, hello? <laughs> Go ahead. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, yes, hi, this is Nora. Um, so yes, I was wondering, um, is there a, a statewide effort, I guess, to, to provide housing or temporary housing for healthcare workers who may, you know, want to live separately from their families during this time? I believe there are accommodations uh, being uh, contemplating at this very moment, but uh, I don't have the specifics on that. Uh, Secretary I, Smith? Sure, Governor. Thank you very much. Nora, there are, there are a lot of things going on right at, right at the moment as we talk about sort of how we will handle a surge capacity within the state of Vermont. There's, um, we're looking at hospitals for them to determine the maximum capacity for things, such things as staff beds, ICU, vents. Uh, PPE uh, within sort of their hospital uh, health service area. And this might include that they have to do additional beds within the hospital facility as well to establish a local service. At the same time, the state is looking at um, using their modeling that we've been talking about uh, that's the maximum medical surge for beds, ICUs, and vents, and that surge will be uh, if, if, if the response goes above the hospital sort of maximum capacity. And we, you know, think we'll be working with our hospital state establishes, you know, uh, targeted alternative care sites. Uh, you've seen some of those, for example. And then you're talking about this uh, special population surge, such things as, um, well, you, well there's, there's this category, the special population surge. And those are areas, a wide array of areas like mental health and social service and long-term care and homeless and uh, prisoner population that may need special need consideration for COVID-19. And then there's isolation sites for people like uh, uh, those recovering from uh, COVID-19, plus uh, COVID-19 exposed healthcare workers who do not want to return home to uh, slow the spread. There is, these various steps are ongoing right now in order to address any potential increase or surge that may happen, as the governor said, in the month of April uh, with this particular virus. All right. Uh, oh, 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 yeah. 
Go ahead, Nora. Just a quick follow-up. Yes, sorry. Um, and so how, how does that work? Is that led by the hospitals or by the state? You know, is it a, a local sort of discussion or, or is it a statewide? In terms of special population surge, we're doing that right now at the state level in terms of finding maximum levels over the hospital. The hospitals are responsible for the initial surge and, and their hospital service area. If it goes beyond that hospital surge area, then the state would, would um, bring its resources in what I would call a state medical maximum, helping the surge there. With the special population, what I was talking mental health, social services, the state is handling that right now and looking at various sites. I think I saw a news story on that this weekend. And then the isolation site would be a partnership with the state and the municipalities and community partners that are out there. Thank you. All right, Alan Keyes, BT Digger. Alan, star six. All right, that's our last question. Oh, Alan. Go ahead, Alan. Go ahead. Up, Alan. Yeah, didn't get all that. Can you try it again, Alan? Yes. Have there been any state workers who were on suspension or paid administrative leave pending the outcome of an investigation and pressed back into service? Um, I have no knowledge of that at this point in time, Alan. Uh, we'll we'll look into that, but I, uh, I I'm not aware. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll look into it and get back to you. All right. That's it. Again, I want to. Oh, go ahead. I'm curious if there's been any change in your assessment that 80 percent of the cases that are diagnosed would not become hugely serious, could be handled by stay-at-home isolation. Any any adjustment in those percentages based on the experience that we've had. Not to this time. Well, again, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. This is extremely uh, important. Uh, and uh, if we can just self-isolate, follow uh, the, some of the procedures and some of the order uh, that we put, have put into place, uh, we'll get through this quicker. Uh, and I want to thank the Attorney General for participating today in his partnership in this effort as well. Thank you.